January 2024, Houthi rebels attack ships in the Red Sea. In response, America sends warships to the area. China says this was adding fuel to fire. As some in the global south respond in anger to the events in the Middle East, China makes strides in its diplomatic aims. They are pointing to this and saying, look, on the one hand, you have the Americans who claim to talk about universal values, and yet here they are turning a blind eye to what Israel's doing towards Palestinians. I think the United States has been working with Arab governments to think through both humanitarian assistance to Gaza and working on a post-conflict plan. It seems to me that China is sitting back and in doing easy things that ultimately are, are not consequential for how this conflict is going to be resolved. How is the conflict in Gaza impacting China mega projects in the Middle East? What are the diplomatic ties between China and Iran, or China and Saudi Arabia? And how will events in Gaza impact great power competition between the US and China? On October 7, 2023, Hamas fighters crossed into southern Israel, killing 1,200 people and kidnapping 240 captives. In retaliation, Israel vowed to wipe out Hamas, resulting in immense bloodshed, millions of refugees in a vast landscape of concrete ruin. As the bombings intensified, China's foreign minister made the country stand clear in a press event at the China-EU high-level strategic dialogue. Whereas the United States and Europe came out immediately and condemned Hamas and labeled Hamas as a terrorist organization, China did not do the same. China China has a long history with the Palestinians, dating back to the times of Mao Zedong. As the Cultural Revolution unfolded in China, Mao provided training and weapons to Palestinians to help them fight against what Mao perceived as the Imperial West. Under subsequent leaders, the approach changed, but China continued to maintain ties with the Palestine Liberation Organization. China and Israel's relationship had also been improving in recent decades. Israel has signed on to China's Belt and Road Initiative. And as a result of that, the Chinese had built ports into Israeli cities constructed a part of the Tel Aviv light rail system, and inked partnerships in high-tech sectors. 
There had also been arms sales from Israel to China. In around 2000, the Israelis were about to sell something called the Falcon uh, radar equipment to the Chinese. And the Americans got very upset about this because this, this could potentially have been used by the Chinese um, you know, in and around Taiwan, which would have affected American uh, flights around the island. And so, of course, at that point, the Americans step in and say, no, Israel, no, Israel, you can't continue with this. And Israel knows which side its bread is buttered. And so therefore it pulls out of the deal, despite the fact that the Chinese put down a, a deposit. China's decision not to name Hamas as terrorists led to strong reactions in Israel. Israel were very upset. There was a lot of resentment and anger. China is the biggest trading partner for Israel. And as such, they, they have a certain weight. But I think there's also a recognition that the relationship with China has a ceiling for Israel, and, and the same goes for China. China looks at Israel and realizes that the Israeli relationship with the U.S. means there's there's a limit to what Israel can and, and will do with China. So I think in Israel, the, the response to, to China um, after October 7th was, this is a very cynical um, play by China to try to score points on the U.S. and, and throwing Israel under the bus. China's response was a stark contrast to the U.S. one, where President Biden pledged billions in military assistance to Israel. American leadership is what holds the world together. American alliances are what keep us, America, safe. American values are what make us a partner that other nations want to work with. To put all that at risk, if we walk away from Ukraine, we turn our backs on Israel, it's just not worth it. In Israel, we must make sure that they have what they need to protect their people today and always. The security package I'm sending to Congress and asking Congress to do is an unprecedented commitment to Israel's security that will sharpen Israel's qualitative military edge, which we've committed to, the qualitative military edge. We're going to make sure Iron Dome continues to guard the skies over Israel. We're going to make sure other hostile actors in the region know that Israel is stronger than ever and prevent this conflict from spreading. The U.S. support for Israel led to anger in some parts of the Global South. The Global South refers to still developing countries and represents two-thirds of the world's population. In Malaysia, hundreds of people rallied near the American embassy in Kuala Lumpur. In Indonesia, the world's most populous Muslim-majority nation, protesters also marched to the U.S. Embassy. But I think certainly there is that sense that the Chinese want to uh, stake a claim, make themselves, provide themselves as an alternative. They want to expose, um, you know, American hypocrisy where they see it. Certainly in the case of, you know, the Gaza fighting, you know, they are pointing to this and saying, look, on the one hand, you have the Americans who claim to talk about human rights and universal values. And yet here they are turning a blind eye to what Israel's doing towards Palestinians. At a global level, the Chinese are using the, the conflicts and the fighting in Gaza as a way of distinguishing themselves from, from the Americans. Mm-hmm.
the U.S. actions in Gaza involving Israel have sparked protests in the United States as well. The president is doing things that reflect some very hard choices uh, and an understanding that everybody can't be happy and all interests can't be satisfied. You're going to have to trade off between them. What China is trying to do is saying this isn't complicated. It's very easy. Uh, the U.S. is being ineffectual. The U.S. is being insensitive to the needs of the global south, with the Palestinians being an example. The only way to explain Chinese action and inaction in this conflict is to say that China sees it principally as a way to take the United States down a peg and portray China as the defender of the global south. In November 2023, a delegation of Arab and Islamic foreign ministers traveled to Beijing to call for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. The delegation chose Beijing as its first stop before meeting officials representing each of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council in Washington, Paris, London, and Moscow. I think it's more symbolic than anything else because I don't think anything substantive came out of the conversations that they had in Beijing. But what I think these Arab and Muslim leaders are, are making a point to the West that the tectonic plates of geopolitics is changing, right? It's no longer, you know, a US dominated world. One day later, the BRICS grouping held an extraordinary virtual summit on the Palestinian Israeli issue. It will be another four months in March before Washington also calls for a ceasefire. What China hasn't done, it hasn't condemned the Hamas attacks of October 7th, it hasn't condemned the Houthi attacks on shipping. When it comes to calling out people for bad actions, all we've seen in China is they've singled out the Israelis. We've seen Chinese social media explode with anti-Israeli and anti-Semitic content. It doesn't seem to me China sees itself in a practical way, trying to move things toward resolution. 一些美国学者和评论家就批评中国在中东和平进程中没有更加的积极主动。您对此有什么回应呢？中国是更多的是从根源的角度。中国看到的更多的可能是，呃，要求呃以色列，比如说在东耶路撒冷和约旦河西岸要限制犹太基金点数量的扩张，啊、呃，比如说在加沙地带的问题上要，比如说想办法啊、呃，不要再继续过去的这种单边的呃全方位的制裁，呃，可能这些的话会有助于巴以之间它对抗这个烈度的下降以及民间相互呃信任的恢复，但是可能从一些美国和西方国家的视角来看，呃，可能巴以问题应当被锁定在当前。前的这种不进不退的一个状态之下，那么维持这样的一个和平，所以说双方的各方的这种判断，它的路径是不一样的，由路径会导致可能对方，尤其是西方国家会对中国的一些立场产生一些啊、呃、批评和怀疑。但是我个人还是认为，当然可以按照西方的这个立场去推动，比如说对哈马斯进行更严厉的制裁啊，或者怎么样。但是如果说真的想要从宏观的角度，恐怕还是要。坚持，就如中国所主张的，在两国方案的这个路径之下。Please be seated. The sitting is open. On February 22nd, Beijing's top diplomat for international law provided a statement to the International Court of Justice about China's stance on the war in Gaza. In pursuit of the right to self-determination, Palestinian people use force. To resist foreign oppression, Israel's oppression has severely undermined the Palestinian people's right to self-determination. Various people freed themselves from colonial rule and foreign oppression to realize independent statehood after World War II. Their practices serve as convincing evidence for the right. Numerous. Aga resolution recognizes legitimacy of struggling by all available means, including armed struggle by peoples under colonial domination or foreign occupation. 
to realize the right to self-determination. Armed struggle in this context is distinguished from acts of terrorism. It is grounded in the international law. The United States, along with others, is engaging intensively with the Palestinians, with Israel, and with other states in the region and within the United Nations, not only to address the current crisis, but to get beyond where we have been, namely to advance a political settlement that will lead to a durable peace in the region that includes lasting security for Israelis and Palestinians and a path to Palestinian statehood. It would not, as some participants suggest, be conducive to issue an opinion that calls for a unilateral, immediate, and unconditional withdrawal by Israel that does not account for Israel's legitimate security needs. Any movement towards Israel's withdrawal from the West Bank and Gaza requires consideration of Israel's very real security needs. We were all reminded of those security needs on October 7, and they persist. Regrettably, those needs have been ignored by many of their participants. November 19th. This video shot by Houthi rebels shows the moment they seized the ship Galaxy Leader. 25 crew members were taken hostage. This was a cargo ship the Houthis claim is linked to Israel. But ship owners said it was British owned and chartered by the Japanese. It was one of the first of many subsequent attacks by the Houthis in the Red Sea. The events had led many shipping companies to avoid this route. Many ships have been rerouted around the Cape of Good Hope, adding an extra 10 to 14 days to journeys from Asia to Europe, and also adding significant costs. There are fears this could add to global inflation, a problem that the world has been grappling with over the last few years. Since 2008, Chinese warships have been helping to protect commercial shipping from Somali pirates in the Gulf of Aden. The Gulf of Aden is right next to the Red Sea. After finishing the missions in the Gulf of Aden each time, the Chinese Navy will sail around the world to familiarize themselves with uncharted waters be it in the Atlantic Ocean, the Mediterranean, or the Red Sea. In recent years, increased funding for the Navy has also enabled a shipbuilding drive that expanded the Chinese fleet rapidly. According to the Pentagon's 2023 China Military Power Report, the PLA has the biggest Navy in the world. It has 370 ships. The U.S. Navy's battle fleet consists of 293 ships. Yet even as a growing number of countries dispatch ships to safeguard the corridor from Houthi attacks, China has resisted intervening with its own naval forces. China has instead criticized a U.S.-led coalition for adding fuel to fire in the Red Sea and Middle East. Foreign Minister Wang Yi, who was on a four-nation tour of Africa in January, said that the UN Security Council has not authorized any country to use force against Yemen, where the Houthis are based.
请问你，尽管中国海军实力雄厚，然后在红海附近的亚丁湾也有长期打击海盗的这个经验，但却不派海军力量来参加红海行动，以缓解 h o u t h i 带来的风险，这是为什么呢？亚丁湾海盗更多的是一种民间的。呃，这种非无政府状态的呃这种劫掠性的行为，但是呢，也门当前沿海地区的这个局势，它和亚丁湾的局势还不太一样，因为也门胡塞武装尽管它的。呃，政府是不被国际社会所承认的，但是呢，他在地方上来说，又事实上是一个呃，比如说首都萨那呀，包括说那个荷台达呀啊、呃、这些重要城市的实际控制者。呃，所以说在和也门胡塞武装的交这个交流当中啊，其实更多的还是要注意政治上的这个呃这种沟通。与此同时呢，胡塞武装的这个行动，它并不是冲着劫掠去的，并不是说冲着经济的利益或者说经济的动力去的，它更多是来迫使以色列停止在呃加沙地带的军事行动。As the Houthi attacks and military response continue, transit volumes through the Suez Canal that connects the Red Sea with the Mediterranean Sea plunged, while shipping costs spiked. As one of the top If not the top trading partner of many European nations, many of the ships that ply this route are transporting goods between China and Europe. China has a very important relationship with Egypt, whose income is down a half billion dollars this year because Suez Canal traffic is is down because of the Houthi threat to shipping. So I think for a lot of Americans, it's just puzzling. Why China isn't defending its partners? Why China isn't contributing to security of global trade? After all, China is a, a maritime trading nation. And it isn't just trade that's a problem. Under the Belt and Road Initiative, China has significant investments in Egypt, in ports, new cities, and economic development zones. Chinese state-owned company Costco. Hold stakes in East Port Said, and also Ain Sokna along the Suez Canal in Egypt. In 2023, Chinese companies also made plans to invest over 8 billion U.S. dollars in Egypt's Suez Canal economic zone. This includes a $5 billion green hydrogen plant meant to export ammonia to Europe, a $365 million power plant. A $300 million iron production complex, and a chemicals production plant, among others. China has also been building Egypt's new capital city. Builders from China are nearing completion of what will be the tallest building in Africa, the 78-story tower. Is set to be the centerpiece of Egypt's yet-to-be-named new capital. This is one part of the new city that has been built by China. As part of its Belt and Road plan, this city will eventually house 6.5 million people and replace Cairo as Egypt's capital city. Chinese firms will also build a rail line connecting this to Cairo. Egypt needs crucial foreign revenue from use of the Suez Canal to pay for these projects. Egypt, their economy has been a very dire straits. For the past few years, you pile this Red Sea crisis on top of an already shaky economy, and you can imagine that it's it's in very very、uh, tough spot. The United States has publicly asked China to use its influence with Iran to stop the attacks in the Red Sea. The Houthis are backed by Iran. They can ask, but I think it's overstating things. I think you know China's influence on Iran is not absolute. You know, whereas there are elements of the Iranian leadership that are keen to align themselves with the Chinese, there are also those in Iran who are wary about you know, becoming too dependent on China, right? So there is some 
dis some attempt within Tehran to distance themselves a bit from the Chinese. So that does limit the the capacity of the the, the Chinese to to call in favors. 很多的西方的这种观点，他会觉得很简单化。比如说，我觉得中国就是和伊朗关系是一个很好的，然后中国就能影响伊朗，然后伊朗就能转过来影响，呃，那个其他的地区的这个组织。那其实可能我觉得对中国国内也会有这种很简单的观点，就觉得说美国能影响以色列啊，就是直接就是以色列就像一个小兄弟一样，然后严轻计从的对美国。所以我觉得这种观点本身它就没有什么特别大的道理。呃呃，可能中国。更多的只能是通过一种沟通的方式，呃，可能会分享一些观点，但是很难真的能够去影响伊朗的这个决策。同样，伊朗也只能是通过一些外部的沟通的形式来影响胡塞武装。但是胡塞武装毕竟来说，他自己内部的事情还是要他他自己内部的派系和各个的政治博弈来做出，而并不一定单纯的来自于伊朗的指示和指导。As attacks on ships along the Red Sea continue. Some Chinese exporters are counting on a decade-old transport artery, one of the first key projects of the Belt and Road Initiative. Chongqing is a major industrial city. Factories here produce laptops, touchscreens, car and motorcycle parts, and all kinds of machinery. Many of these goods would usually have to travel across the Red Sea to reach consumers in Europe. But in recent months, there's been a surge in demand for train cargo services. This is what the Chinese call the Iron Silk Road of the 21st century. From this station in Chongqing, trains will speed through China to Kazakhstan, Russia, Eastern Europe, and Poland before arriving in Germany. Some of that trade has been impacted by the war in Ukraine the last two years, but now demand for its services are up again due to the attacks in the Red Sea. But even if the trains ran more frequently, its volume can't quite compare with ships. While a large container ship can carry over 23,000 containers, an international freight train from China to Europe usually handles around 80 to 100 containers. Billions of dollars worth of oil lies beneath these fields, but international sanctions have strangled Iran's energy sector for decades. Many oil fields here were using old machines and rusty infrastructure. They needed investment, and it was the Chinese who came to their aid. This facility was constructed by the China National Petroleum Company in partnership with the Iranians. At one point, Chinese workers formed half the workforce at the site. There's some suggestion that the Chinese are importing around a million barrels a day, and with the barrel of oil at around eighty dollars per barrel, even if you account for a discount of four or five dollars on that barrel, you are still seeing more than three billion dollars going into Iranian coffers from the Chinese every month. China isn't just a key buyer of Iranian oil; it is also the main provider of all manner of goods in Iranian bazaars. As sanctions were imposed on Iran, imports from China soared. Chinese machines also prevail in Iran's transportation network. The buses in Tehran are mostly from China. Chinese car brands dominate the road. And Tehran's metro system was built from scratch with Chinese capital and Chinese engineers. The train cars that run on it are, of course, also Chinese. Inside Iran's modern malls, Chinese brands are also at the forefront. Mandarin is a popular course in Tehran's universities. Jie Shang, Jie Shang, Fu Zhuang, Fu Zhuang. 
。我很喜欢中国，很喜欢中国的历史、中国的文化。用“一带一路”，呃，我们呃可以呃和中国人交朋友，还有呃可以生意。这样生意就呃可以呃帮助我们的呃经济。China represents about 30% of all of Iranian trade, and Iran represents less than 1% of Chinese trade. So it's pretty clear that China is the more dominant player. Whether China wants to use its influence with Iran is, is much less clear. That influence is debatable. China has been their number one trade partner. Uh, since I believe 2010, um, by a very large margin. Um, at the same time, uh, China's trade is is not very impressive, you know, compared to the trade it does with uh, Saudi or the UAE, for example. So, China's economic relations with Iran, I think, is very dissatisfying for the Iranians. You've seen a lot of、uh, leaders in Iran say they're they're not satisfied with the discounted oil. Um, they want to renegotiate the discount. They've been doing a lot of trade through bartering, and they're getting what they consider low-quality goods for oil. China's auto exports are flooding our market, and there's a lot of frustration in Iran with the、um, depth of China's、uh, involvement in their economy.、Um, it's a very asymmetrical relationship. Despite years of sanctions, Iran has a sizable economy. With an estimated 413 billion in gross domestic product, according to the World Bank, Iran, with a population of over 80 million people, is the 36th largest economy in the world. It holds some of the world's largest deposits in oil and natural gas reserves. Various reports have estimated Iran's annual funding to Hamas to be between 30 to 60 million dollars. And it is not only Hamas that Iran funds. The Houthis are another part of a network of proxy militant groups and state actors in the Middle East, supported by Iran. Major actors in the network include Al Hashad Al Shabi in Iraq, the Syrian regime, Hezbollah in Lebanon, as well as Hamas in Gaza. They are part of an informal grouping. Known as the Axis of Resistance, these groups are united by their hatred of Israel and the West. The extent of Iranian influence over the Houthis is actually relatively indeterminate. Yes, we know that they've been providing them with equipment, but it's never been enough for the Houthis to take control of the whole of Yemen. <laughs> If the Iranian and Houthi relationship was really as close, then presumably the Iranians would be keen for the Houthis to take complete control of the country. The fact that the Houthis have their own sort of interests, their own actions, suggests there's a certain degree of autonomy and distance that themselves have with the Iranian. Actions undertaken by the Axis of Resistance hurt the Chinese economy indirectly. In 2019, Houthis attacked a Saudi Arabian oil processing facility. They fired 18 drones and missiles, setting the facility ablaze. Saudi oil production, briefly, was、uh, was curtailed pretty significantly, and what that meant for China, which at that point was, I believe, importing about 16 percent of its crude from Saudi, you know, the price of oil shot up. And again, it was very brief, but. The resulting price increase was costing China something to the tune of 97 million dollars a day. Now, I can't imagine that in Beijing they would look at the situation and say, "Yeah, we're going to support Iran," you know, as it destabilizes a region where we get between 40 and 50 percent of our our crude oil. As China grapples with some economic problems caused by the axis of resistance. A narrative appears in the United States. They call it the Axis of Evil 2.0: China, Iran, and Russia. The term Axis of Evil was first used in 2002 by Bush while referring to Iran, Iraq, and North Korea after the 9/11 attacks. I think it's overdoing and overstating、um, both.
you know, the 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 act, so-called Axis itself, as well as Chinese influence in the region. But let's not forget, there's a lot of tensions within these relationships. The Russians and the Chinese isn't as harmonious as it's supposedly put out. The, the Chinese have not got fully on board with the Russians when it came to the invasion of Ukraine, for example. Similarly, when it comes to Iran, Iran needs the Chinese far more than China needs Iran. This idea that the, the three of them are working in unity and tandem is, is debatable. If you look in the Middle East, you'll see Russia, you know, supporting the, the Syrian government in this civil war, creating a lot of instability in a region where China, of course, has economic interests and it wants stability more than anything. You know, Iran threatening China's most important partners. I know that a lot of folks think that Iran is China's natural partner in the Middle East. But if you look at which countries they have the biggest populations, uh, the most contracts, the biggest investments, the highest trade, it's, it's you know, Iran's rivals. It's the, it's the Emiratis, it's the Saudis. Um, so when, when Iran is threatening, you know, regional stability, this threatens or undermines China's interests in the region. So to me, this, this demonstrates that this, this idea of an axis is, is a very thin one. On the shores of the Red Sea, China and Saudi Arabia are working together to build a city of the future in the desert. This is a convergence of China's Belt and Road Initiative and Saudi's Vision 2030 plan to diversify the economy and reduce its reliance on oil revenue. The futuristic new city is the brainchild of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and it is expected to cost 500 billion U.S. dollars. The Saudis have been working alongside their Chinese colleagues for seven years now to translate this ambitious vision into reality. Well, I know that the Sines are in this area. They are in this area, and they have the ability to build the current and the current technology, and they are the biggest product in the world. The light of the sky and the light of the sky, اللوح الشمسية أنا وتوربينات الرياح هي رائدة جدا في هذا الأمور فهذا وأنا مثل ما قلت لك قبل إنه أنتم عندكم الخبرة وإحنا عندنا الأرض فنقدر نتكاتف ونتعاون مع بعض ننجز مدن عظيمة. Much of the new city's supporting infrastructure, from power stations to the electricity transmission networks to telecommunication infrastructure, are being built by Chinese companies. A large-scale power station composed of over 4,000 rows of solar panels is already up in the Red Sea new city. These solar panels have an additional robot installed to cope with the unique weather conditions of Saudi Arabia. Chinese contractors have also built an artificial wetlands in the desert. Its purpose is to treat sewage and recycle water. When completed, it will be capable of treating 16,000 cubic meters of sewage, helping the city achieve its goals of recycling water in the desert. Economically, the Saudis matter far more than the Iranians do. So the Saudis do offer a fantastic market, and it's a high value market because, of course, individuals are much richer. So even though it's a smaller population than, say, Egypt, it is a richer population. So there is a scope for Chinese exporters to tap into all of that. There's a whole host of infrastructure and construction projects. And I think all of this links in neatly with Saudi Arabia's own efforts at economic diversification, which it's currently doing through the Agenda 2030 strategy. China and Saudi Arabia's diplomatic relationship has been deepening. When President Xi visited in 2022, his plane was escorted by four fighter jets from the Royal Saudi Air Force, which trailed colored smoke in red and yellow, colors of China's national flag. 
Earlier, Saudi Arabia had revised its national education curriculum to include the study of the Chinese language at all levels. In 2023, after Xi's visit, it was announced that China Bao Steel Group, one of the world's largest steel maker, would be investing over 400 million in a steel plant in a joint venture with two Saudi companies. That same year, Saudi oil giant Aramco signed a deal with Chinese partners to build a refining plant in Northeast China. While the Saudi firm also announced a plan to buy a 10% stake in the Shenzhen-listed Rongshen Petrochemical. Saudi Arabia is also considering increasing its use of the Yuan in bilateral energy deals. And the Saudis and Chinese also inked a deal to allow Huawei to build cloud computing capabilities and high-tech complexes in Saudi cities. In 2023, before the war in Gaza, it was announced that Iran and Saudi Arabia will end a seven-year diplomatic rift and restore diplomatic ties. Chinese media said that President Xi personally took the initiative to help persuade the leaders of these two countries when he met them. The Iran-Saudi deal was seen by many analysts as a clear sign that Beijing was stepping up engagement in the Middle East. It seems to me that, that the Chinese tried to create an image in March when they brokered a, a deal between the Saudis and the Iranians that Chinese diplomacy was powerful, was salient, was relevant, was a different way of resolving the issues. As I look at the diplomacy that's going on in the, the Israeli war in Gaza, I not only don't see any Chinese role that has any consequence, but I see the United States being the reference point. The United States has been trying to engage with the Israeli government to change its both strategy and tactics in Gaza. It's been working with international parties on returning hostages and creating a ceasefire. It's been working with Arab governments to think through both humanitarian assistance to Gaza and working on a post-conflict plan for both the West Bank and Gaza that would lead to Palestinian statehood. I think that there are any number of lines of effort. You could argue it's not effective yet, but the fact is the U.S. is at the center of all the diplomacy, and China at best is on the periphery of all the diplomacy. There's obviously your calculations going on in Beijing that on the one hand, it's good to put yourself forward as a responsible global stakeholder. On the other hand, there is also the practical risks of doing this. If you are unsuccessful, this can damage your prestige and credibility. So do you really want to get involved in that? Professor, you live in Abu Dhabi. Can you tell us how Arab countries perceive the actions of America in the ongoing crisis versus the actions of China? In the eyes of the people of the Middle East, which superpower is seen to be more constructive as a peacemaker? I think there's just a deep frustration with both countries, you know, um, with the U.S. Um, we've seen in recent weeks U.S. officials speaking in a way that more people in the Arab world were hoping they would have spoken like earlier, saying that Israel's actions are uh, certainly going beyond the level of what people in the region consider close to acceptable. I've been working nonstop to establish an immediate ceasefire that would last for six weeks to get all the prisoners released, all the hostages released. As we look to the future, the only real solution to the situation is a two-state solution over time. A lot of people in the region probably look at America and think, okay, you, you have this leverage, you give so much money and a lot of political support. There's an expectation that if anybody could temper Israel's uh, response, it'd be the U.S. With China, I, I think, again, it's really just shown everybody that China is not the political actor that maybe some folks expected. You had the uh, you know, rapprochement between the Saudis and the, the Iranians, and then the BRICS and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. You know, it really there was this narrative that China was increasing its its political roles. And then this crisis hit. 
And China, it didn't have the answers. So I think for folks in the region, they've looked at it and thought, we we had we expected more. We thought, you know, the the we kind of bought into the hype. And I think what people have realized in the past few months is, you know, China's not ready for that role here yet. It may never be. If you listen to Chinese leaders, they'll say the right things that we want to play a bigger role, but they never say we're going to lead the Middle East. We're never going to replace the U.S. And I wish more people would listen to Chinese leaders when they say this, because I believe that they legitimately mean it. I know that many Arab countries and Western countries will think or hope that China can make a very important or decisive influence. 但实际上，中国朝现在来看，我们还不具备这个力量。另外一个呢，就是中国国内的这种呃科研实力啊，对中东的科研实力或者对中东的这个呃知识储备，呃还很弱，非常非常弱。尤其对巴以问题这种研究是非常弱的。所以很多时候我们在进行这个相关的介入的时候，还还不具备这样的一个能力。呃呃，第三个，我觉得最重要的影响还是来自于巴以双方自身。呃，包括我们看到以色列，它国内的这个决策是受到它国内政治的影响，这个是外部力量没有办法去呃去去呃这个左右的。同时呢，巴勒斯坦，呃也好，尤其哈马斯也好，它是受到它自己内部派系关系的这个影响，所以也很难是由其他国各方单独去进行游说的。所以，我觉得中国的作用还是会在国际层面以一种积极的建设性的作用去推动巴以之间的和平，希望能够早日实现。但是呢，我也很难说中国能够在此发挥决定性的或者主导性的作用。我觉得这种幻想还是要抛弃掉。